Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the books of, or the letters really, of First and Second Peter. They're entitled, Feed My Sheep, First and Second Peter. And this is lesson number 10 in that series entitled, Prophecy and Scripture. It's a lesson for June 3 of 2017. Before we begin, we hope that you have your Bible handy with you, and we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we ask God to guide us. Our wonderful Father, we are here recognizing the presence of your Holy Spirit, recognizing how much we need your guidance, your life, your help, even to understand the simplest things in Scripture. Help us not to be misled by the falsehoods of Satan that he has tried to to perpetrate through the whole world to try to infuse in everybody's lives, but we, we know that we have a power and a means to resist them through Jesus Christ. May that be our experience as we study this lesson as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As we mentioned last week in our lesson, it was pretty clear to Peter that he wasn't coming out of this Mambertine prison to be a free man. He knew that he was about to be crucified, and he, I don't know how long he, he thought about this, but we have pretty good evidence from the ancient uh, early Christian writers that he specifically asked to be crucified up, see, upside down because he thought it was too great an honor to be crucified in the same way that Jesus was crucified. Of course, Ellen White supports that view as well. He wanted to leave the people in the Christian communities that he was writing to, the best evidence he could that would teach them the ways of Jesus Christ that was certain and reliable. And his mind, that certainty was based at least partly on the fact that he personally had experienced the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. He was an eyewitness, and he, he mentioned specifically the time that they were on the mountain, Mount the Mount of, we call the Mount of Transfiguration. And they, they, they saw Jesus' body lit up like a light bulb almost, you know. Um, I, I try to imagine, you've probably seen author, uh, you know, artists try to portray it, but I'm sure it's not even close to what uh, it was really like. But Peter says there's something more that gives us the hope and gives us a certainty and the reliability of all this, this stuff that we're telling you. It's not just my recounting my personal eyewitness accounts, but it's the sure word of prophecy. He recognized that his readers wouldn't have the eyewitness experiences that he himself had had, so he said, look at the evidence of prophecy. So what, what do we mean when we talk about the evidence of prophecy? Fulfilled prophecy. Okay, would be what does that mean? Just in a couple of simple words. It's just amazing that God knew the beginning from the end. He knew 2,000 years ago that this gospel would go to the whole world. I mean, that was an incredible statement yeah. to make at that time. Yeah, yeah and in terms of prophesying about Jesus, he, we know Micah 5.2 tells us the exact place where he would bo be born. Daniel, Chapter 7 tells us the exact time he would be born. I mean, how more precise can you get? And then lots of other things about his crucifixion and so forth that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, Peter, of course, mentions other things, um, his eyewitness experiences. Paul talks about his eyewitness experiences, about the incredible things that happened to him in his, in his life. And those are, those are convincing. Those are good. We, we, we enjoy talking about those stories. But they both thought that looking at the prophecies of the Old Testament and how they were fulfilled in the, in the life uh, and, and death of Jesus Christ was an even greater evidence. So let's, let's look at that. 1 Peter 1, verses 10 to 12. Start with that. It was concerning this salvation that the prophets made careful search and investigation, and they prophesied about this gift which God would give you. They tried to find out when the time would be and how it would come. This was the time to which Christ's spirit in them was pointing in predicting the sufferings that Christ would have to endure and the glory that would follow. God revealed 
to these prophets that their work was not for their own benefit, but for yours, as they spoke about those things which you have now heard from the messengers who announced the good news by the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. These are things which even the angels would like to understand. What does that mean? Even things which, are, which obey, the angels would like to understand? What could the angels possibly learn from what's going on here on planet Earth? This is a microcosm of what's happening in the universe. Okay. I think God is giving the universe a little idea of what happened in the universe on a speeded, you know, uh, accelerated, at an accelerated rate. Okay. It, it appears that none of the angels have died yet, mm -hmm. and yet we do. They sinned long before we did, mm -hmm. yet we die. So he's accelerating the whole process to show us where evil takes us, mm -hmm. and also to show us that at the end there'll be some who recognize the message of God, which is his power, of transformation of the human heart, and will thus vindicate God when that happens. Well, you could put the, that uh, verse 12, the latter part of verse 12 there, into which angels long to look, that you got Colossians 1, 19 and 20, and Ephesians yep. 1, 9 and 10, and John 12, 32, and uh, what, 1 Corinthians 4, 9, uh, the, and all fit with that one text. And you mentioned three great places. I would like to mention one more. Look at, um, look at Ephesians 3, 7. I was made a servant of the gospel by God's special gift, which he gave me through the working of his power. I am less than, this is Paul, of course, speaking, I am less than the least of all God's people, yet God gave me this privilege of taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ and of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through, at the, through all past ages in order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. That's a good, good great text too. Mm. Yeah. How does the church, how do, think about this now. He's saying the angels who stand around God's throne are learning something about God, the one they're standing next to, from us down here on planet Earth. How could that possibly be? How, and how many other Christian religions understand that? No. And it's well, how many Seventh-day Adventists really yeah, understand? Sure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I know that's sure because I was, <laughs> a few weeks ago I spoke to a pastor or a what, radio pastor and uh, the Jesus' death was, was for the benefit of the heavenly being. Oh, no, no. So I had to quote, give a few, few texts there, and it blew them away. Yeah. Yeah, and it was concealed. It, it, not because God concealed it. No. We just didn't fail to see it, therefore it was concealed to us, and Jesus came to change that. So the concealment would end. And there are things that you don't understand when you're younger that you no, understand when you're yeah. older. Jesus said, I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. Yeah. So there's an yeah. unfolding of things. You don't understand this until you understand that. Sometimes it's nice, though, to get, get the, a clearer picture earlier on. So as you go through life, I, and I give credit to Ellen White in Chapter tw uh, t uh, 29 of Great Controversy, uh, The Origin of Sin, Why Was mm -hmm. Sin Permitted? I mean, that Great Controversy microcosm that was presented there has become a prison, yeah. a pr prism, not a prison, prism for, for everything in life. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, it's pretty clear that when speaking to Jews particularly, the early disciples repeatedly used the prophecies of the Old Testament as a leading argument in favor of Christianity. So in doing so, they were probably following the example of Jesus. Can we think of any time when Jesus used the prophecies of the Old Testament to prove that he was the Christ, the Messiah? Oh, yeah. Hmm? Several times. Several times. Probably the one most obvious is the road on, on the road to Emmaus, right? Right. Clearly. Well, there's lots of others. Matthew 26, 54, Luke 21, 13 to 34, and John 5, 39 and 40. But, um, but he, what, and, and the, the reason what's significant about him doing that is he wanted them, to, when he's gone, 
to be able to go back and review and, and, and to get it s settled in their mind based upon the sure word of teaching. Okay, let's, let's scratch our heads for a moment. What prophecies in the Old Testament can you think of that predict the sufferings of Jesus? Well, Isaiah 53 certainly comes Isaiah 53 is an obvious answer. Any other places? There are a number of Psalms that, that Jesus himself refers to. Psalms 22 has several places. Psalms 2 has some places. Um, Psalm 63. Yeah, exactly. Now, if you go back and read those Psalms in their entirety, you recognize that they originally applied to some situation back in David's day. But they were also prophetic of what would happen. I mean, like, they will look on him whom they pierced. And, and they gamble over my clothes and so forth. I mean, these are obviously references to, to Jesus. Yeah. Now, I don't know whether anybody ever gambled over David's clothes, but, uh, you know, there it is. Um, but it's interesting that at the same time that that's there, in places like Zechariah 12 and Jeremiah 33, it points to the fact that someone is going to, this Messiah is going to eventually rule the world. So how can you suffer and die and eventually rule the world? Obviously, there has to be a resurrection, right? Well, not only that, but he went to his death to show us that love does not stop short of death. Exactly. And if we don't get that message, we've missed most of it. Yeah. And he and told Pilate that this, my kingdom is not of this world. So it wasn't just a matter of, you know, subduing yeah. the uh, kingdom of love. Kings. It was a matter of... Uh, righteousness and peace it comes within you yeah and the fact is that this kingdom that's going to be established by this messiah is going to last forever so it was pretty clear i mean that's daniel 7 that's daniel 2 there's uh, jeremiah 33 several places which also says that sin will never rise again yeah because his kingdom will last forever so peter assures the people to whom he's writing you live in a very special time. What was special about their time? They've just learned the truth. <laughs> and that truth is about what? Eternal life is that they know the, the only true God, which is the God of love. They know what love is for once. <laughs> try, try to imagine now, Peter and Paul probably both had spoken to these Christians to whom Peter was writing at one time or another in their experience. Um, we don't know exactly when and for how long Peter was there. We know a little bit about Paul being in Ephesus for some three years, and he no doubt traveled up through those areas and spoke to these different people. What would you think of having the experience? Suppose, suppose Peter could walk in the door right now and sit down, and we could ask him questions about his experience, or Paul, but especially Peter, I think, because tell us about the experiences that happened to you and when you were with Jesus that are not recorded in the New Testament. Imagine the stories he could tell. We could be, I mean, we wouldn't, we wouldn't droop an eye, I don't think, all night long if Peter would keep telling us stories. We would be just, we, the, 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 the truths of the gospel which are yet to be revealed, I think, are just mind-blowing. We haven't even come close to understanding the marvelous things that God has to teach us. Well, so Peter says, you people, live in a great time, a wonderful time. It's a time when we can tell you not only about the prophecies, but how they were fulfilled in, in a personal friend of ours. But then there are some prophecies that reach way down to the very end of this world. And who needs to look at those, especially? It's us, right? There are prophecies there that are not going to be fulfilled until the second coming, even the third coming. We live in a very auspicious time. If you look carefully at the biblical prophecies, as far as we can tell, the only prophecies that have not yet been fulfilled are those prophecies which are directly connected to the second or the third coming of Jesus Christ. We live in an auspicious time. Well, um, Look at a, a few passages. Look at, uh, let's, let's, let's pick in this time, let's take Mark. All the gospel writers talk about this. Um, 
As soon as Jesus came up out of the water, this is his baptism, at his baptism, he saw heaven open and the Spirit coming down on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my own dear son, I am pleased with you. Okay? And the, all the gospel writers talk about that. Um, how many people standing there understood what was going on? Probably nobody. Probably didn't hear Jesus. The clear. I don't know if they heard Someone God say heard this is, well, he must have. Something, yeah. This is my beloved son. It's hard to. It still didn't keep him from having a doubt later on. Yeah. And uh, therefore, you can wonder if how much of it he really understood. He had his portion of the gospel to bring to the world, but Jesus had to do the rest. Mm -hmm. Well, think of how many miracles Peter must have witnessed. I, with his own eyes. I mean, did it eventually just get to be, oh, okay, another miracle. I mean, we, if, if we could have a document, well, I, I, you, all, many of you at least know about someone on television a while back who said, well, Someday we're going to have a resurrection from the dead on live TV and we're going to convert the world. So one miracle, as far as he was concerned, was going to convert the world. Well, Peter saw, I'm sure, hundreds and hundreds. Not only that, what did Jesus t say to his disciples in Matthew 10, verse 18, 8, I'm sorry, the first time he sent them out? Heal the sick, bring the dead back to life, this is Jesus' instructions to his disciples, including Peter. Heal those who suffer from dreaded skin diseases and drive out demons. But as important as that is physically, mm -hmm. it's even more important from a spiritual point yeah. of view. Exactly. Drive, I mean, to resurrect the dead means those who are dead in spirit, who don't know God, who have no clue about what he is and what the mission of Jesus when we fail to see the real reason for his coming, mm -hmm. we fail to see the love of God in its true light. Because uh, saying that he came to pay for sins means that God wanted him to do that. And it kind of throws a very strange light on God. Yeah. Sounds like God is demanding the, his pound of flesh or something. Yes. Well, not only all of the things we've mentioned so far, but Peter saw his experiences in the Garden of Gethsemane. He saw him being tried, and we don't know whether he actually saw him being crucified or not, but he knew he was crucified. And then he saw the empty tomb, and a little while later he saw the Jesus appear to them in the upper room. He saw Jesus multiple times. We don't know how many times, but we know he saw him at, in Galilee. And then finally, that final, about 40 days later, Jesus took them out of Jerusalem, walked down through the Kidron Valley, up the Mount of, of Olives, and just over the hill, and there he ascended to heaven. And Peter, Peter saw all those things himself with his own eyes. So, here's a quiz, a little trivia question for you. What was the very first miracle that was directly connected with the coming and the ministry of Jesus Christ? The marriage in Cana. Okay, that was the first physical miracle, miracle but yeah. were there other miracles that happened before that? Can you think of an example? Well, we can read your notes so we know. <laughs> <laughs> you cheated. The very first real miracle was the appearance of Gabriel to Mary saying, you're going to have a, you're going to have a baby and you're a virgin, right? Yeah. And then, of course, a short time later, he appeared to Joseph, right? And the first, first physical miracle you mentioned already that happened after he began his ministry was changing the water into wine. Which, by the way, is a miracle showing that it's all about transformation. Yeah. yeah. And the wine represents the blood mm -hmm. that comes out of this container. We are the container filled with water at first. Mm -hmm. And the water is the Spirit of God. And that Spirit changes us so that we're willing to have our own blood spilt out yeah. of us. Look at, look at 1 Peter 1, starting with uh, verses 17 and 18. 
We were there when he was given honor and glory by God the Father, when the voice came to him from the supreme glory, saying, This is my own dear Son, with whom I am pleased. We ourselves heard this voice coming from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. What experience is Peter talking about? Transfiguration. Okay, and where did that happen? That's a trick question. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> On the mount. <laughs> On the mount. Some mount somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, how many times did that kind of an experience happen in the, during the ministry of Jesus? We've talked about the baptism already. We've talked about the mount of transfiguration, wherever that was. Can you think of another time? Our crucifixion? Well, the, but I'm, I'm talking about times when the God actually spoke and people heard it. Maybe all they heard was thunder, but they heard it and they saw something. Can you think of another time? Something right at the end in Jerusalem in the temple. Yeah. Area. Remember when the, the Greeks said, we oh. want to see Jesus? L look, look, let's look at that for a second since people are apparently not quite so familiar. If I can find my cursor here. Look at John 12. Starting about verse 25. Oh, I'm sorry. I got the wrong. Um, get to John 12 instead of 21. Um, Philip went and told Andrew. These two Greeks had appeared to him. And told the two of them. The two of them went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, "The hour has now come for the Son of Man to be re to receive great glory. I am telling you the truth. A grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain of that is dropped into the ground and dies." If it does die, then it produces many grains. Those who love their own life will lose it. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me so that my servant will be with me where I am and my father will honor and speak, uh, will honor anyone who serves me. Now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, do not let this hour come upon me? But that's why I came, so that I might go through this hour of suffering. Father, bring glory to your name. And then what happens? Then a voice spoke from heaven, I have brought glory to it, and I will do so again. The crowd standing there heard the voice, and some of them said it was thunder, while others said an angel spoke to him. But Jesus said to them, It was not for your sake that this voice spoke, but for, not for my sake, but for yours. Now is the time when this world will be judged. Now the rule of this world will be overthrown. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. And saying this, he indicated the kind of death he was going to suffer. So how many times do we know of from the gospel when a voice was heard from heaven? At least three. three at least three, yeah. yeah. And as far as it's quite possible that his three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, were there present when all three of those things happened. It's quite possible. Because we know that James and John and Andrew, Peter's brother, were, were there at the, at the Jordan, and Andrew went right out immediately and called his brother Peter. So it's quite possible that Peter was there for that one, and we know he was there for the other two. Well, Peter was told, and James and John were told, as they were coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration, don't tell anybody until Jesus has been what? Raised from the dead. Raised from the dead. But now Jesus is long since raised from the dead, and Peter says, now it's time for me to tell everybody, right? He could not help but recognize that Jesus had a very special relationship with God the Father. I mean, imagine if you're sort of falling asleep and you're about half, a, half awake there and all of a sudden this incredible light and you look up and there is your close friend that you've been walking around with and he's just shining with the glory of God. I mean, I don't know how you explain that. Well, look at Second Peter 1.19 as we move on here. So we're even more confident of the message proclaimed by the prophets. You will do well to pay attention to it because it is, like, it is like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the light of the morning star shines in your hearts. So when is, the, when is it that the day dawns and the light of the morning star shines in our hearts? People have different ideas about this. What are some of them? You remember? Well, a lot of people say this applies to 
the second coming of Jesus. And that's one good possibility. Other people says it's, it's talking about the actual experience that we each individually can have when we accept Jesus for the first time. It could also be the time when the remnant will finally get that message so well that the... Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> that would be powerful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, his character and his government in contrast to the terrible darkness that has spread over the world because of the lies and misrepresentations of the devil. We live in a darkened world ruled by the prince of evil, but a glorious light has shone on those of us who are, ready to, who are able to read, understand, and comprehend the truths of the Bible. When Peter talked about the day dawning, do you think he was talking about the second coming of Jesus? Was he talking about the glorious light shed on individual souls? We've, we've mentioned that already. Look at Matthew 24, 14. This is a very familiar verse. Hopefully all Adventists have memorized it. And this good news about the kingdom will be preached through all the world for witness to all nations, and then the end will come. So uh, how close are we getting to that? Not sure, because it says this singular gospel. How many are there around the world today? <laughs> well, and she says the final movements will be rapid ones, so the um, things in, will go rapidly. In her book uh, describing her own experiences entitled Christian Experience and Teachings of Ellen White, she says the whole earth is to be illuminated with the glory of God's truth. The light is to shine to all lands and all peoples. Have any of you witnessed in Bhutan yet or Sikkim? And it is from those who have received the light that it is to shine forth. The day star has risen upon us and we are to flash its light upon the pathway of those in darkness. I believe that the truth will become so powerful that everybody will want to talk about it. They'll say, why didn't we understand this sooner? Yeah, yeah. And we need to understand another important part of this whole thing. The entire Bible from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22 is about God and about Jesus Christ. Who is the God of the Old Testament? Yahweh. Yahweh, Jesus himself, the Messiah. It is God's letter to us, his children. When properly understood in the larger, larger context of the great controversy, every chapter and every verse is a revelation of the truth about God, and Ellen White speaks about that very powerfully. Okay, so we go to the next couple of verses, 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21. So we are even more confident of the message proclaimed by the prophets. You will do well to pay attention to it because it is like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the light of the morning star shines in your hearts. Above all else, however, remember that no one can explain by himself or herself a prophecy in the scriptures. For no prophetic message ever came just from human will, but people were under the control of the Holy Spirit as they spoke the message that came from God. So, what prophecies do you think Peter was talking about? Well, any prophecy... Uh, Paul says, we know in part, we prophesy in part. Let the prophets speak one at a time and let the others pass judgment. So it's, it's not one person just being the only mouthpiece. There's, uh, there's many who speak, yeah. and we need to come together in love. Peter in contrasts to, this. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I thought you were. No, no, uh, to, in love in order to, yeah. to dispense the message. And to, have full, uh, to understand more of it. Yeah. Peter contrasts this message from God, the gospel, the good news, with what he calls a cunningly devised fables that were believed by the pagans in his day and by many critics and even nominal Christians in our day. I have to, I don't know whether to smile or to cry, but we're approaching Easter. And every year at Easter time, the major news media come out with, okay, d and I just read a couple days ago, was there ever a real Jesus? Or was it just a story they made up? I mean, give me a break. And then before that, it was talking about, well, if we're supposed to be 
we're supposed to be fair to everyone, we're supposed to be equal opportunity to religion and so forth like this, then that means that the voodoos and the, and the Hindus and the Buddhists and everybody, we should treat them with Christian love and kindness. But the messages they have, there's no way they're equal to the message of Jesus Christ and the Christian message. There's no other message like this. It doesn't even come close. Right. Well, now he's talking about no messages given to an individual, a private individual. What, what, what's, what do you think is the implications of that? Certainly doesn't mean we're not supposed to study the Bible for ourselves. Peter himself emphasizes the necessity of our studying scriptures for ourselves in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 and 13. I think that Peter implies a lot more than just what we traditionally call prophecies, which is foretelling the future. It has to do with the entire message. And that's unfortunately what has been confused over time. Yeah. I know, Fred, you've talked about this before. How many different churches are there in the world? Just talking about churches. In 2001, there were 33,000. Yeah. Incredible. Not churches, denominations of Christianity. Really? Boy. Oh, boy. Mm. Yeah. Well, in all that, what is God saying? He says, you can't just grab your Bible, pick out a few verses that say something that you like, and say, well, we're going to start a new denomination. <laughs> Paul, Paul, Peter says here, you know, when you come up with a new idea, if you've studied and you've come up with a new, uh, uh, an idea, talk to your Christian friends, talk to your fellow mem church members and so forth. We're supposed to come together. We're supposed to consult on these things. We're not supposed to run off in every other direction, every crazy direction, trying to say, oh, I found the latest thing or whatever. Um, thousands, even millions of supposed Christians have wandered into fanaticism and error because they wanted to believe something new, some new idea, a new revelation, separate from the larger body of Christians. However, in contrast to that, we need to be honest, there have been the, the larger Christian church down through the generations has repeatedly gone wrong in the past by ignoring the fairly obvious teachings of Scripture. I mean, think of all the, the, the false things that many Christians believe. So and Jesus predicted that they, these false teachers would come. So we are only safe as we study the Bibles for ourselves, and then we carefully test every belief against the Scripture, and what Christian examples does Paul talk about? Does Luke talk about in Acts 17? Do you remember who did that? We need to spend more efforts studying the Bereans. The Bereans. Words of yeah, Jesus. the Bereans here, if I can. I seem to lose my cursor here. The people there, that is in Berea, were more open-minded than the people in Thessalonica. They listened to the message with great eagerness, and every day they studied the scriptures to see if what Paul said was really true. Have you ever wondered what scriptures that they had access to? Only the Old Testament, as we sure. Know. But even how much of the Old Testament did they have? <laughs> well, it'd probably been the Septuagint. Yeah, since they were in in Greece. Yeah. That's the well, Greek translation of the Old Testament. It was yeah, they spoke, written. Yeah, they spoke, they spoke Greek all over. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if uh, even in the Holy Land, as we call it. <laughs> well, we know that there were, um, the Bible is not just as a, a, a collection of stories to entertain children or, or adults uh, in our, when we don't have anything else to do. The Bible very clearly, and, and this is the famous passage, let's, let's look at it real quick. In 2 Peter 3, starting with verse 15, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 3, starting with verse 15, and you remember that every since you were a child, Paul writing to Timothy, you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God, and uh, I think it probably would be more correctly translated, all inspired Scripture is useful for teaching the truth, rebuking error, correcting faults, and giving instruction for right living, so that the person who serves God may be fully qualified and equipped to do every kind of good deed. How does that work? Well, let's look at some 
possible explanations. We believe that the writers of Scripture were holy men of God, moved by the Holy Spirit Himself. By the way, were there any women writers in the, in the Bible? Not that we know of specifically. Yeah, I, I would have answered that same way until recently. It's not really true. In the book of Proverbs, the last chapter mm. is written yeah. by a woman. Yeah. There's at least one chapter. <laughs> Maybe some of the Psalms. Mm -hmm. Now we have statements from women. We talk about Deborah and we talk about yeah. Huldah and we talk about Mary and others in the New Testament. But as far as writing, as far as I know, that's the only place. Yeah, because in Luke you have Elizabeth and Mary both sure. uh, yeah. magnificat, you know, right. prophesying. And the but, Song of Miriam. Yeah, sure. If we carefully follow its guidance, we have nothing to fear for the future. That is the Bible. Ellen White says, in reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say, praise God. As I see what God has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. We are now a strong people if we will put our trust in the Lord, for we are handling the mighty truths of the Word of God. We have everything to be thankful for. That was a comment she, a letter she wrote back to the General Conference in, on, it was read on January 29 of 1893 at the General Conference. It was true of Adventism, it's certainly also true of Christianity as yeah. a whole. Mm -hmm. We forget where we come from. <laughs> well. And that's been, I mean, it was, how many times did they forget in the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. yep. Well, Second Timothy 3.16, which we read for a moment ago, Paul gives a brief outline of why he thought the Bible was important. He mentions three main points. One, the doctrines of the teachings of the church, which are Bible-based, teach us the truth about God. That's number one. Two, biblical guidance comes when we accept reproof, correction, or instruction in righteousness. Those who carefully follow the guidance of Scripture and thus avoid evil will follow the truth and will be protected by this revealed will of God. Three, this wisdom will lead to salvation. All of Scripture is to teach us about God, not only on a theoretical basis, but also in watching God deal with his rebellious children through thousands of years. Is it any wonder that Peter regarded these marvelous truths as a bright light shining in a dark place? And again, Ellen White said, it is the first and highest duty of every rational being to learn from the scriptures what is truth and then to walk in the light and encourage others to follow his example. We should day by day study the Bible diligently, weighing every thought and comparing scripture with scripture. With divine help, we are to form our opinions for ourselves as we are to answer for ourselves before God. The truths most plainly revealed in the Bible have been involved in doubt and darkness by learned men who with a pretense of great wisdom teach that the scriptures have a mystical, a secret, spiritual meaning not apparent in the language employed. These men are false teachers. It was to such a class that Jesus declared, ye know, the scriptures, ye, ye know <coughs> not the scriptures, neither the power of God. And by the way, how well did these Pharisees know the scriptures? They would have memorized large portions. They portions. would mem have memorized, some of them probably memorized the entire Old Testament in Hebrew. And yet, he and says yet. you don't know it. What does he mean? Yeah. They don't know the truth about what it says. And it didn't have, a, it didn't have an application to their lives. No. The language of the Bible should be explained, I'm reading on from Ellen White, the language of the Bible should be explained according to its obvious meaning, unless a similar figure is employed. Christ has given the promise, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, John 7, 17. If men would, put, would take the Bible as it reads, if there were no false teachers to mislead and confuse their minds, a work would be accomplished that would make angels glad and that would bring into the fold of Christ thousands upon thousands who are now wandering in error. Great Controversy 598 and 599. And a little bit later in another book, in Testimonies of the Church, Volume 5, she says, The Bible, with its precious gems of truth, was not written for the scholar alone. On the contrary, it was designed for the common people. 
and the interpretation given by the common people when aided by the Holy Spirit accords best with the truth as it is in Jesus. The great truths necessary for salvation are made clear as the noonday and none will mistake and lose their way except those who follow their own judgment instead of plain, the plainly revealed will of God. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 331, paragraph 2. That's why I choose to, and some of you may wonder why, I almost always use the Good News Bible in my teachings here because one of the one of the things that the committee set down to do when they did the translation of the Good News Bible to say, okay, this has to be expressed in the language of the common people. In fact, they wanted to make it so straightforward and so plain that it could easily be translated into any of the languages of the world. And it has been translated into many languages. Biblical scholars like Martin Luther have said repeatedly in various ways that the scripture is supposed to explain itself. The Bible has an underlying unity in it that is our safeguard. And again, I, I'm, I'm quote from Ellen White, Testimonies volume, uh, Testimony of the Church, Volume 4, when you search the scriptures with an earnest desire to learn the truth, God will breathe his spirit into your heart and impress your mind with the light of his word. The Bible is its own interpreter, one passage explaining another. By comparing scriptures referring to the same subjects, you will see beauty and harmony which you have never dreamed. There is no other book whose perusal strengthens and enlarges, elevates and ennobles the mind as does the perusal of this book of books. Its study imparts new vigor to the mind which is thus brought in contact with subjects requiring earnest thought and is drawn out in prayer to God for power to comprehend the truths revealed. If the mind is left to deal with commonplace subjects instead of deep and difficult problems, it will become narrowed down to the standard of the matter which it contemplates, and it will finally lose its power of expression. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 499, paragraph done. Paragraph 1. I don't know how many of you have heard this, but I'm sure you have. Uh, back when I was in college, they used to say, great minds talk about ideas, Mediocre minds talk about events, and small minds talk about people. It's an interesting thing to think about. Well, in my experience, a book-by-book -book study of the Bible has been an enormous benefit to those who have undertaken it with a serious intent. The very glory of God is revealed in its pages. And if you would like to try that with some of your friends, we have Bible study guides for every book of the Bible on our website at T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. So what about that? Are, any, are there any doctrines or teachings which you believe or fear might be cunningly devised fables? Do we have any cunningly devised fables in our Adventist 28 doctrines? Can you, if someone just stopped you on the street and said, explain to me, one of the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Could you do it? Have we investigated those doctrines for ourselves? I've had people challenge me with the idea of going through our 28 doctrines and talking about how we can support them or maybe have to modify them for ourselves to be able to explain them from Scripture. And that's something I'd like to do sometime, but it seems like I, I have enough to do right now. <laughs> So why do you think so many people are attracted to personal interpretations of Scripture? Serves them well. Okay. It, and, and it, it, I suppose it, may, it gives you a, a superior, a, some, to, to some it gives them a feeling of superiority. We have the truth and you, all you people out there, you don't have the truth. We have the truth. Knowledge puffs up. Yeah. So why are these people s reluctant to submit their ideas to the valuation and consideration of their fellow Christians? Well, subjective experiences, which may be very impressive to us as individuals, must never be our ultimate basis for truth. It's too easy for us to be deceived. Peter wrote about his own sensory experiences, but then he w went on to talk about the more important fulfillment of prophecy. 
We live in a time and a place where incredible trust is placed on scientific experimentation. Observation through testing is supposed to lead to ultimate truth. But even the very best experiments are tested by statistics which recognize that there is at least a remote possibility that the results of that testing are not true and are just coincidence. And I quote again from Ellen White. This is, uh, I'm sorry, this is our adult teacher Sabbath school Bible study guide. We live in a very scientific age, yet cynicism abounds regarding the possibility for determining truth by objective methods. The means by which truth was supposed to be determined in the modern period was the empirical method, eliminating uncontrolled variables such as the supernatural so that all aspects of matter could be accounted for under strict testing conditions with many observers over time in order to produce an assured result. In many areas, including religion, no consensus was produced over an extended period of time. So cynicism developed regarding the possibility of any assured result from this method. Consequently, postmodernism came in denying any absolute truth or any meta-narratives. Meta meta What's a meta-narrative? It's the grand picture of mm -hmm. how everything works. That fully explains something. Personal experience became the basis for truth without all truth being subjective and relative to one's experience. How does Peter's message address this tension? Well, remember we said back at the beginning that Peter's message talked about two things. There was his personal experience, and there was the proof from Scripture, right? Which he thought was even more important. So, how impressive is it to you uh, to compare scripture, something you read from scripture, versus something that's, quote, proven by scientific methodology. Do those things ever come in contact with each other, conflict with each other? In a way they do. And the problem I think we have is that everything in the universe has been corrupted by sin, by evil. Therefore, everything is in fact relative. Time is relative, as Einstein explains it. Matter is relative. Everything is relative. Energy. And there's only one thing that is absolute. It's the love of God. Mm -hmm. And that should God tell himself. us something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So naturalism only works if God really doesn't exist. Uh -huh. But if God exists, then naturalism certainly can't explain it. Well, if it, it falls short, you know. As why is it? Says, a, okay, sorry. As it says, uh, uh, can a man by searching find out God? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're if you're going to you're going to say okay, everything has to be proven by scientific method, how would you ever prove God? Well, scientists though will say that science proves nothing; it only can disprove things. There you go. Uh, unless you're just uh, somebody uh, talking head on TV or something, then, then of course you've got proof. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you're trying to win an argument, but uh, strictly speaking, science doesn't prove because mm -hmm. uh, there's always the possibility that there's another experiment that might disprove the whole thing, which Einstein uh, also mentioned uh, regarding, regarding his work. Well, Here's a very interesting comment, not widely known. Comments from Ellen White. This is in the book Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, pages 109 and 110. Um, this is an interesting book, and, and many people are not uh, familiar with it, a book that she wrote in cooperation with her husband. Experience is said to be the best teacher. Genuine experience is indeed superior to mere theoretical knowledge but many have an erroneous idea as to what constitutes experience. Real experience is gained by a variety of careful experiments made with the mind free from prejudice, uncontrolled by previously established opinions and habits. The results are marked with careful solicitude. That which many term experience is not experience at all. There has not been a fair trial by actual experiment and thorough investigation with a knowledge of the principles involved in the action. 
here is, w here is where we have met the greatest difficulties in scientific matters. No, religious matters. The plainest facts may be presented, the clearest truths sustained by the Word of God may be brought before the mind, but the ear and the heart are closed, and the all-convincing argument is, my experience. Some will say, the Lord has blessed me in believing and doing as I have. Therefore, I cannot be in error. My experience is clung to, and the most elevating, sanctifying truths of the Bible are rejected. Many examples might be given to show how people have been deceived by relying upon what they supposed to be their experience. Wow. And that's repeated a number of times in other places, as you can see. Peter recognized that skeptics would question his accounts. And that, of course, is just exactly what has happened. Some skeptics want to claim that all the evidence that Peter laid down to prove his testimony is just more proof that this letter was not written by Peter himself, but by someone else trying to prove that he was Peter. Such people do not want to recognize that they were prophesied by Peter himself in 2 Peter 3.1. And what does 2 Peter 3, I'm sorry, Peter 3.3 3 say? First of all, you must understand that, that in these last days, some people will appear whose lives are controlled by their own lusts. They will mock and will ask, he promised to come, didn't he? Where is he? Our ancestors have already died, but everything is still the same as it was since the creation of the world and, and so forth. Do we ever hear that anywhere uh, among scientific groups, particularly in our day? Well, it's uniformitarianism. Yeah. You know, the, the present is the key to the past. Yeah. So if you study the, how things are right now, then that tells you, and then you reason back from there, that tells you how things were back there as well. But really nothing has changed. Yeah. Uh, except, mm. except the accumulation of yeah. things, the, the gradual and slow changes that we I seen. was listening to a, a lecture just today by a famous geologist. And he talks about two layers out, not in the Grand Canyon itself, but a place not far from the Grand Canyon, where there are two layers just perfectly fit together. Just no space between them at all. There they are, and there's no, there's no you know, erosion or anything in between. He says, boy, this is an unconformity. There's a billion years of time between those two layers. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> Assumption. Well, we have been warned repeatedly in Scripture not to be best misled by any evidence presented just to our senses. Matthew 7, 15 and 24, 24. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 14. And 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. Revelation 13, 13 and 14. In our day, we recognize that not only are there people who can use sleight of hand to deceive, but also the art of deceiving the senses has become a major goal of the movie industry. Think of, I mean, all the really blockbuster movies that are coming out are full of attempts, various kinds of ways of, of deceiving the senses. We are hastening to, I mean, if a child who didn't know any better, there are, there are cartoon characters that look like they're real. We are hastening toward the day of the second coming of Jesus Christ, and nothing, absolutely nothing, should be allowed to distract our attention from this most important truth. Jesus Christ himself is the day star. Astronomers identify the planet Venus as the morning star because it shines brighter than any other object in the heavens. In the same way, Jesus is to shine brighter than anything else in our lives. Peter wanted us to understand that nothing else is as important to us, as important to us every day as reading understanding and developing a full confidence in the prophetic word of God. It is impossible for any human being or group of human beings to have made up these prophecies and caused them to come true hundreds of years later. Can you do that, Fred? Can you do that, Dennis? Jim? Carrie? Can you make, can you make a prophecy and make sure it happens, it comes true years, hundreds of years from now? We can't even predict what's going to... If you can predict even tomorrow, I'll, I'll, I'll pay you to predict the stock market for me. <laughs> well, you have to be able to control it. So if I said my hand's going up in two seconds, one, two, 
yeah, I can do that unless, of course, <laughs> I had a heart attack or a stroke between yeah. what I said and what I did. But so you, you to the extent you can control, <coughs> but what what can we control? Yeah. We also must recognize that the Bible was not written just for scholars. We already went, one, read one passage about that, but here's another one found in Selected Messages, Book 1, page 21, paragraph 1. The Bible was written by inspired men, but it is not God's mode of thought and expression. It is that of humanity. God as a writer is not represented. Men will often say such an expression is not like God. But God has not put himself in words and logic and rhetoric on trial in the Bible. The writers of the Bible were God's penmen, not his pen. And she added this clarification, it is not the words of the Bible that are inspired, but the men that were inspired. Inspiration acts not on the man's words or his expressions, but on the man himself, who under the influence of the Holy Ghost is imbued with thoughts. But the words received receive the impress of the individual mind and the divine mind is diffused. The divine mind and will is combined with human mind and will, thus the utterances of the man are the word of God in the following paragraph. Well, do you have any questions about the reality of scriptures? Reliability. Reliability. What did I say? Re sorry, oh, sorry, the reliability of scripture. Yeah. Do you fully value every part of scripture? When was the last time you read through the Old Testament? Hmm. We may, we may say that we believe in the Bible. Remember that the devils also believe the Bible. James 2, uh, right there. They believe in what, what, how does it affect them? Tremble. They just tremble with fear. But do we trust its teachings and make them the guiding lights of our lives? Are we committed to the truth? That's the question. So God is saying, it's good for you to know these passages. But the kind of knowledge I'm talking about is the kind of knowledge which actually enters in your lives, makes it, has a transforming effect on you so that you become a partaker, not just of some human knowledge, but the divine knowledge which makes you a partaker of the divine nature. We can become like Jesus, not in our own power, but through the Holy Spirit working in us. And that's what God, God is waiting for people like that to stand up and be counted so the gospel can be presented to the world and this whole terrible crisis come to an end. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this privilege we have of representing you in our studies of the scripture and of these lessons. May we become more like you as a result of our time together is our prayer in Jesus' name.